We have a situation on hand where there is this coronavirus in, in, in China. And like everything else, everyone takes things for granted and just hope it go away. But this one seems to be mushrooming and blowing up and it's reaching far into our communities. It's in Europe, it's in the United States. Only God knows where, where, where else. So, the Minister for Health is here, fresh from, y'all had a meeting, right? Yes. <laughs> and and I, you, you can appreciate why I couldn't make it. I'm here sweating. <laughs> so, I'm going to ask the Minister to give you a report on, on that, what the government plans to do, uh, is planning to do about the virus. And while he's here, while he's here, we'll take the opportunity to talk to him about the incinerator and the derelict vehicles and all those things that the Minister for Health is responsible for. You could touch, touch on NHI if you wish. Minister. Minister. Good evening, everyone. Great. So, um, I... I'm pleased to be here tonight to talk to you in what is of concern to each of us as residents here of the territory because at the end of the day, this is now a global issue, the entire coronavirus. So I'd like to thank Honorable Fraser for inviting me, for having me, and um, as, we, as we go through the, um, the different plans that we have, we would see that there are a number of actions that we have put in place. I'd like to, again, acknowledge Leader of the Opposition, Honorable Marlon Penn, and see any other members? Not as yet. I'm sure other members will show. The, um, we've had a meeting today of the cabinet. They, we actually introduced, um, we had the head, the chairman of the quarantine authority, the chief medical officer. We also had the CEO of the hospital services administration. And they were presenting the various initiatives and I must say, coming out of the meeting, we had a number of other suggestions which I would incorporate in terms of um, some of the ideas and initiatives that were pinpointed. We will incorporate it into the strategy that we have in moving forward. As you're aware, we have a, um, up to 170 persons now that succumb to this disease, um, but we do have cases of where 124 persons were released after being tested, after being found positive, and they were actually released after some form of treatment. Some nations have gone as far as taking their nationals from China and putting them in an area because there's a quarantine period of about 14 days. Dr. Scatliff is here, so he, he will nod every time. He will go this if, I, if it's yes, and he'll do this if it's no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he will just give me an incorrect sign. But uh, the fact is, is that um, we have to work together. So this is not just a quote-unquote government initiative. This is this is you, this is me, because all of our health and our well-being is um, involved in this. So we met on Sunday, um, members of the Quarantine Authority, and I was able to sign the instrument, basically the letter, um, putting this into action. And there are a number of agencies, some of which we got um, once I place the message out. There were a number of people who were able to say, well, what about this specific authority? So in so doing, 
On Tuesday, there was a meeting of a number of departments and heads, including the Ministry of Health and Social Development, the Department of Information, the Virgin Islands Port Authority, the Airport Authority, Department of Agriculture, Customs, Immigration, BVI Health Services Authority, Department of Disaster Management, Environmental Health Department, Her Majesty's Prison, Royal Virgin Islands Police, and sorry, Fire and Rescue, Deputy Governor's Office, BVI Tourist Board, and the Department of Education. These various departments and bodies are responsible for large bodies of uh, persons, and getting the word out is very important. We have looked in terms of enhanced surveillance um, of acute respiratory infections. We've increased public health education and awareness, focusing on the 2019-2019 novel coronavirus. We have made recommendations um, recommending everyone to take preventative measures such as proper hand washing techniques. It was only now that I know that um, unless you are prepared to wash your hand properly, some said 15 seconds and others say um, 20 seconds, the, um, if you were to say your ABCs while you wash your hand, then you will have the technique in terms of the, the, um, the amount of soap you need and wash your hand, not just gently patted by proper washing of your hand. And all of these, um, all of these techniques will be going out even more encouraging the use of personal protective equipment by health workers so that you'll see these guys in the hazmat, all, almost hazmat type suits so that they will be able to protect themselves because health workers are the most susceptible to uh, the spread of these virus and you have to make sure that they are protected in every way. We'll be conducting training programs, implementing advanced processes for the effective management of ill passengers at all ports of entry. Now, the team, when they came to the table today, they didn't have an aggressive enough approach at the ports of entry. So I've already on the way down because I had to drop someone up at the um, airport, sorry, at Trellis Bay. And I've already made calls and we have a number of equipment you, can, you know, can point straight at your forehead and temperatures and different things. So we are going to have that implemented. We're going to buy or purchase a number of these so that whether it's at the airport, the seaports, or the other major ports of entries, we'll be able to deploy persons who can um, use this equipment so that we can test for high fevers and um, after that, we can then monitor where you've traveled in the past days. So if, you, if you're traveling from a high-risk post and you have high fevers, well then, you then become a suspect and you'll be tested. Um, you know, additional tests can be you know, administered. So we're going to take ideas, we're going to take suggestions, and we're going to make sure that whatever is required to have the populace safe, sound, that it is done. We are going to meet also with the seaports and airports authorities and the health offices from various um, islands because our passengers, they come in through St. Thomas. They fly into St. Thomas and they come over here. They fly into Puerto Rico to come over here. They fly into St. Martin to come over here. Fly into St. Kitts from international posts come over here. So we want to make sure also that they are doubling up on the protocols so that at the end of the day, um, if they're doing the screening, then when we do our additional screening, we'll know that we have done all that we could to identify the various cases and make sure that this is done in a way that will be pleasing um, to the populace, number one, that would be prudent in terms of making sure that um, we catch it, catch it early, and we have this done. There is a quarantine area that we have to look at, at the various ports also. This 
um, is either going to be a fixed area where if someone is um, suspected and they're questioned, then they could be quarantined um, until when they can get them to a more permanent quarantine area for a 14-day period. If we don't have the space, then they have medical tents that could be set up and equipped for this particular purpose. So we're going to look at that also and make sure that this is done. So we have to, we, uh, we have a way of um, getting this done. There's a full program ahead and we're gonna be pushing this forward. The, the schools, because at the end of the day, it is said that if you have a compromised health, health um, condition and you're caught with this, you then, you know, then is when the most danger is. If you have a healthy body and you get caught with it, it's, chances are you can survive it. But the elderly, they are most vulnerable when it comes to conditions such as these. So we're going to make sure that we protect my golden gyms. I always tell them that uh, since I'm closer there than where I was 20, 30 years ago, then I have a special interest in making sure that um, we protect um, our golden gems and not have them vulnerable to these. That is where we are at this time. You can rest assured that all of the international, WHO, the CAFA, all of the regional and international agencies uh, we are in direct contact with, they're in daily communications with them. Um, the World Health Organization, they're meeting for fourth time to decide what level of warning they send out. They already have a, a, um, they already have a particular advisory saying there's a worldwide um, issue and they're looking in terms of additional measures that they would recommend as a result of all that is um, happening at this time. So we are working with the international agencies, working with the regional agencies, and working with all of the different groups. And if we, and if we miss any special group, then you can always, you know, I can always add it here, push a button, type in a few words, and, and we can actually have this done from tomorrow. So, um, the agency is there, it is active, and is prepared to do whatever is required. That is that on that point. Any other issues you want me to? Okay, one or two questions here. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, do we have the capacity to test for the virus, or are we going off of identifying symptoms and forming a conclusion? Well, I'm told that this is a cold, it's a flu, it's a, so there's no, there's no, um, there's no specific symptom or test area, because even in terms of getting the, uh, the known cure for it, there's none, but it could be in the form of a common cold, it could be in the form of flu, it could be in the form of this. So once, you, once, you, once your temperature is elevated, then you'll, you'll have to be questioned as to your last set of travels in the last few days so that you can then, um, you, um, it, you know, they can narrow it down. So do we have the ability? Yes, because it is one in which we do. You have to understand, influenza, um, and I'm doing the research myself, so when they come and, and it's actually, um, it is supported by the medical specialists. Influenza in the United States, for instance, I am told that over, was it 125, sorry, um, 30 million people, 15 million people have been, had the flu during this season. And there were over six to seven thousand deaths as a result of influenza. Um, you see that this is this is a particular issue. We every year, I'm on, you know, I'm understanding that there is a specific set of 
vaccinations or medications sent in for the flu season because different strains or trains uh, happen from year to year. But in America, you would hear that the flu season is on, go and get yourself vaccinated. But down here, everybody's afraid of needles. A little needle, everybody's afraid of it. But it can save lives. So at the end of the day, um, we can then, so they have excess medication sitting at the hospital and nobody, nobody taking their flu shots. So you're invited to go to any of the clinics, you have one right here, go to any of the clinics, and um, go to the hospital and you can get your flu shots and um, protect yourself from the common flu. Okay. We are, we are a vulnerable area in that it is so many islands. How are we able to monitor all our islands and who come in at night? We know what ha can happen. People come in in boats at night from varied areas, illegally. How are we able to monitor those persons? Uh, do we have help from the United States Coast Guard, the United States Virgin Islands Coast Guard, or whatever system to help us? Because, yes, we have the airport. We have the ports with the ferries coming from St. Thomas. We also have those coming from um, Jos Van Dyck, and you have wherever else we have the day sales. But what about those other little islands out there that we know we pick up people from who are dropped off at night? That is a, that's more of a border control issue. No, I would but actually, if, they're coming, if they're coming in with... No, no, I understand you. But border control has been an issue throughout the particular region, uh, human trafficking, drug running, all of this and so forth. So yes, your point is well taken, but um, in terms of the surveillance, there is, you would hear from time to time, um, they have interdiction of persons being brought into the territory illegally. And this will have to be continued. But as it relates to whether or not deployment will be made as a result to catch anyone coming in illegal because of the, no, no, I understand you fully. So I'm, I know, the company infected. So, I, so by the border control, we'll have to enhance that so that we can then look at this. Yes, sir. You mentioned about a quarantine area that is to be put in place. Uh, also, possibly a tent that is not yet in place. Is that right? Yeah, because uh, if we don't have a designated area or one is not available, then you can have a field triage type area. You know, you can okay. have a field. Uh, All right. Just wanted to make sure because. Uh, as we talk now, the, the virus is already active, even those things are not yet in place. My thing is, assuming that some, somebody comes in from one of those high-risk areas, naturally they're gonna have to be screened. Do, do you have anything in place to sort of uh, protect the customs and immigration officers who are gonna have to screen such people? The answer is yes. They, they, um, they're the first line of training in terms of how to protect the frontline persons, immigration, customs, um, even the greeters, those that greet you at the airport and all of those. So, so there are specific conversations and specific provisions to help to protect your frontline persons. Uh, this is why the um, fire department, the police department, and all those are are being trained in how to do this. This is not new to the quarantine authority because remember we had SARS. We had a number of other viruses that um, had entered our shores and they had to activate these measures before. So there was a protocol for um, how these are dealt with. You mentioned the um, Ports Authority. You haven't mentioned those two big words, which are your biggest front line. 
The two words are cruise ships. What are you going to do about screening? Are you going to rely on the cruise companies themselves to monitor their own passengers and keep them isolated? Or are you going to have somebody standing there with his little temperature measurer trying to measure 8,000 people coming off the ship? Okay, great. The, um, the, the comforting news about cruise ships is that they have a, a, a tighter protocol than any of the other um, sets of passengers coming in. They have to protect this because this is a close quarter. As big as the ships are, holding six and eight and 10,000 people in those small quarters, they are, they are, in fact, called upon to do even more. And we are one of the ports that requires a 24-hour notice from the cruise ship as to anyone who may have fallen ill for whatever purpose, and now so more than ever. You would have heard that um, internationally, there were two passengers that were, had fallen ill on a cruise ship. Where was this? In Italy. In Italy. And the entire ship was quarantined so that they have the doers. In fact, I'm told that Unfortunately, I didn't take too many cruises, but the one I did take, you would see that they're wiping down rails and they're wiping knobs every second there because they know that it could be transmitted easily to this. So they have a bigger and a better protocol than a lot of other nations, island nations even. So that, is, that has been a question, that's been a concern, and that has been addressed. Minister. While you're here, can you tell us the latest updates on the, on the incinerator? Yeah, well, we're pleased to announce that the, well, you, you may have heard this, but if not, well, the control panel, the much talked about control panel, um, it has arrived, it's been installed. Constitutech, the equipment manufacturer, have sent someone here for the past two to three weeks. It's been tested, it is running. There are some mechanical issues because this heat that came out of the other, um, you know, of the fire, it affected other areas. So there were some water leaks because of some pipes or some holes that were that needed to be replaced. So since last Friday, it's been going through tests. So they, it was activated from last Friday. It is in um, better stead. Um, today, and they say that they're going to be able to run on a 24-hour shift to come, uh, I think it's Saturday they intend to start to run 24 hours, but they, they have some mechanical, simple mechanical issues, thank God not major, but we then have this um, coming. It would then reduce the need to bury untreated garbage up on the, um, on the, on the landfill. This untreated garbage consists also of empty or damaged propane tanks. And garbage itself have its own gases produced and the spontaneous combustion. So it was not a program where they went and lit the fires in order to get a burn. They, they have it buried, buried, buried. But in these cases, wherever you have land filled, fires in St. Croix, fires in St. Martin, fires everywhere you have a landfill situation. And the only way to get this done is to go back to what you were doing, get the incinerator uh, moving. And you didn't ask, but I'll tell you that once we have this completed, Agency Red is a consultant company that are looking at a comprehensive waste management program and the concept of recycling must be put in place, reuse, reduce, um, rethink. We're gonna reform our laws so that we can give it teeth in terms of um, the different ill stuff. I'm passing down and I'm seeing a, a 23 cubic foot refrigerator sitting on the side of the bin. Now, they could have gone down to the, down to the dump with that. They didn't have to, take out the truck, they had to have some effort to take that out the truck and put it down next to the bin. Why not go and take it to, to its proper location? 
but this is, um, uh, there will be constant fines until, improve, until performance improve. Here's what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to align these fines or when the cameras go up, the number of the plates will go down. They'll be sent to DMV. And until you pay your fines, you can't get your vehicle registered. Minister. We have to get this done. Minister, um, the other thing I'd like for you to tell the folks here is something that something that some of them might be waiting to hear and can benefit them directly is your program for recovery. Those folks who still are still in need of material to finish the projects that were destroyed by the hurricane, how, how is your ministry helping them with that? Okay, great. You would know that when we were done inviting people to register um, with the department, we had over 695 applications that came in. When they reviewed this, it needed some over $35, $40 million. 15 was afforded um, to this particular program. And in order uh, for us to help those really in need, because it was not an insurance program. It was to help those who basically found it difficult to help themselves. So that was the first set in terms of mind. There were put in place back then a policy or a program where you have social assessment, you have the actual quantification of the damages, the amount of damages, and then they were rated, all of the applicants were rated, and those that, were, that had the highest score in terms of need, this was done. When we went in there, they had a specific program. When we went there in um, February and then March and April came, they had a program where $3 million was placed towards grants, $7 million was placed towards loans, $3 million towards social homes, and we had a program where the loans, no one that was suggested for loans, the bank would approve. So this money, this $7 million was sitting there and no one can get it. So we had to take it back to cabinet and repurpose that and put it into the grant section. But still you had the, you had the assessment there necessary to be done. The figures will come out, the number of persons assisted will come out. In order to assist more people, not less, we had to, again, re reprogram how we looked at it. Because in the early days, you had some people who were granted 150,000, 100,000, 75,000, and the person who needed $15,000 worth of work couldn't get it. So we said, okay, fine. In order to look in terms of making sure that the scarce resources were spread as much as possible, we would do a roof and window and door and, and electricity program. We have a number of persons who benefited from that. But then again, there were people who were not qualifying. So we had to then uh, with the kind and generous move of the, of the Premier, we were able to put aside $1.2 million and offer $7,500 material grants. You would remember that in the early days of the program, there was a $2,500 material grant. But we found that we needed to pivot towards that. But we did not want to take the monies that were already short and put it towards that. So $1.25 million was placed in the material grant vote, and it is still ongoing. But the issue is, is that you have to, it has to be a place you live, number one. You have to have some ownership or some connection with the property. You can't just not have ownership to it, and then it's just qualify for it automatically. So if you are damaged by the storm, if you live in the house, if you either have ownership of it or if the person who owned it has passed, but you can show that you have some kind of, um, you're named in the will, you have something which connects you with the property, then you can get qualified for the $7,500 grant that is there. We were, able to, um, we were able to use $250,000 of that for the month of December with pushing because, remember, Treasury had closed from early. 
but we were able to have them extend it so that more people can get the help, not less. We also have, right now, um, about $650,000, $750,000 left in that particular program that um, if you qualify for it, it's not a refund policy. If you need the material, if you're damaged by the storm, if you have some connection with the property, then you can, there's an application form and we were trying best we could to make the process so that people can get the help they need and get it now. There are those homes, because they have been flattened, $7,500 in material will make no sense to them. They still are going through some of the process so that um, the, the monies that are remaining in the grant program could be used um, to assist those persons even more. And they might well be, and um, your honorable member will be able to vote yes on this, because if we need another $5 million, he'll vote yes. And he'll make sure that everyone in, in the third district can have access to it. Yes. <laughs> okay. See, I told you. <laughs> So, sure. good night, Minister. I'm Esther here, BVI News. Um, if we were to come face to face with the virus tonight um, at any of our ports of entry, what is the level of preparedness um, as a territory? Well, in the hospital, we have four quarantine area or rooms and so forth that we have. Number one, we have um, the healthcare administration folks have been already under guard because, as I'm saying, the protocol for this has been experienced during the SARS uh, attack. Um, and there are others, Dr. Dr. Scalif could tell me, you know, th you know, the other viruses and the other epidemics that we had. But the hospital is ready in terms of doing this. We have, to, we have a 14 day, I am told, I'm informed reliably, that there's a 14 day quarantine period quarantine period that we have. If we need to expand this area, there are provisions that we have already looked at as to where we can get additional rooms. We hope, we trust that this will never come to this and that we can then handle this appropriately. I want it. Good evening. Um, just wanted to follow up on the incinerator question. What is the status of the air scrubber that was uh, slated to go to Pockwood Pond? The member here is a pessimist when it comes to the scrubber. He has seen and he has heard about this infamous scrubber. Um, how many years now? Too many years. Yes. I had discussion with Consutech, the equipment manufacturer, and they considered the fact that the scrubber, part of the payment was made about three, four, five years ago for the scrubber. When the, when the equipment was placed in, it should have been there. Their story was that um, the subcontractor went out of business and they then had to purchase this for a higher price. It has been the bone of contention for years. But they have assured me that during the first quarter, and um, Honorable Fraser will not hold me to this, he will give me a little bit more extension on this one. Um, because I came in, I met it. I'm going to deal with it. It's going to be, the scrubber is going to come exactly when I'm promised the first quarter in 2020. Um, by doing the scrubber, you would lessen the amount of pollutants that will emit even from the very incinerator. So this will give you cleaner air and even more environmentally friendly. Yes? Thank you. Minister, I want to thank you for taking the time to come to address your constituents. Yes. I want to remind you that these are the folks that put you where you are. <laughs> so thank you so much. Give him a hand. Give the minister a hand.